Right, so thank you very much and uh, for inviting me and for the opportunity to give this talk. And <clears throat> usually I give uh, technical talks, uh, but I noticed that <clears throat> this session was already uh, had many technical talks, <clears throat> heavily logic based. And what I feel or felt <clears throat> is that um, what, what uh, logic deserves uh, uh, in the world, but also in Korea is, is more promotion of logic to other uh, mathematicians, to other scientists and to the general public. So uh, one aspect is of course, <clears throat> uh, doing deep theoretical studies and investigations, uh, thinking and then presenting that to other logicians, but my purpose uh, here right now and today is uh, kind of to try to broaden the audience <clears throat> of people and to increase the appreciation of logic beyond the realm of logicians only. So please bear with me when my talk is uh, deliberately not going to be <clears throat> on the technical side, but more on the side of advertising logic by itself. So, um, so the, the question, uh, the purpose, the use of logic. Logic is often considered too theoretical, particularly by applied mathematicians, incomprehensible and esoteric. And uh, is that really the case? Superficially, this uh, is an understandable uh, objection because if you look at <clears throat> um, publications in logic, uh, then they look like this. And this uh, throws off not just arbitrary scientists, but also um, general mathematicians. Although these are just the rules of inference that every mathematician uses, just mathematicians tend to use these rules uh, implicitly and intuitively and logic formalizes this. Uh, then I took the liberty of taking a screenshot of a, uh, some talks that were given earlier today. And again, <clears throat> it uh, uh, um, arguably other mathematicians might, will find it hard to even understand uh, the statement of the th uh, theorems, not to mention the proofs. And here's another example. So please don't be offended. Uh, because I'm your, on your side, I am a logician, but I'm also here today, I want to make a deliberate effort in trying to advertise logic, not to you guys, but to other math mathematicians and to computer scientists. I think computer scientists are a very suitable audience um, to convey to the use and applications of logic. So that's why I chose the title of my talk, So Much Logic Underlies Nowadays Computers. They were in order to raise awareness that all the computers that we use all the time these days and the computers that are the subject of investigation by computer scientists heavily build upon and use logic, although uh, people are not really aware of that. So let me try to... Um, uh, raise that awareness here and now and today. So that being said, let's uh, start. And I want to start with a, uh, um, a report on an earlier publication like 20 years ago. Uh, there was a publication on the unusual effectiveness of logic in computer science. So the purpose of that was basically the same as what I'm trying to do uh, here and now to raise awareness on computer scientists of the uh, benefits or as it's called here, effectiveness of logic. Um, and this uh, paper was written by some, uh, indeed of a famous logician, Joe Halpern, Robert Harbert, Neil Immermann, the Turing Award winner, uh, Kulaitis, uh, Moshe Vardi, and Victor Viano. And in this uh, uh, paper, uh, there were uh, several chapters, for example, one chapter about descriptive complexity, um, starting with Fagin's theorem, 
a structure, a set of structures is in NP, you know, the famous P versus NP millennium problem. So that's something that uh, every computer scientist is well aware of, and that even can be advertised to people on the street, right? Millennium price problem P versus NP and Fagan's theorem for um, phrases that millennium price problem in terms of logic, specifically in terms of um, second order existential uh, logic of a, a set of finite structures. So NP is equal to second order logic, uh, existential only uh, for, uh, quantified formulas. So that's one way of selling the use of logic as an approach to solve the millennium problem. Another uh, uh, quote from this chapter is Immerman's theory from 1988, namely characterizing parallel computation. So CRM means concurrent uh, random access machine. T of n steps, running time, parallel running time is the same as what can be expressed in first order logic with T of n quantifier alternations. So again, uh, deep uh, properties of co in complexity, deep question complexity characterized in terms of logic. Quanti parallel time is quantifier depth. And another quote from that chapter from that work is uh, uh, about several works that appeared uh, simultaneously by Immerman and by Vardy, all about basically the same uh, question, namely, a problem is in polynomial time if and only if it is described in first order logic with the addition of the least fixed point operator. So again, um, question in, uh, in uh, um, complexity theory, polynomial time uh, characterized in terms of logic, this time using the least fixed point operator. So this is one way of uh, conveying the importance of logic as an approach to solve the millennium problem. One chapter from this paper. So another chapter from this paper, other chapters from these papers uh, elaborate on the use of logic as a database query language. Well, database is something that uh, everybody uses, right? And uh, telling people that databases are heavily uh, built on logic, um, helps uh, emphasize the importance of logic. Programming language, again, something that every computer scientist use and uh, is closely related to type theory, again, from logic. Then there's a, um, a so-called uh, zero knowledge proof and uh, um, um, the um, 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 Right, communication protocols um, in in uh, using the uh, um, uh, PCP theorem and another approach to solve the millennium problem and reasoning about knowledge and not knowledge. Uh, that's the work of Joe Halpern, for example, is also formalized in terms of logic. And then there's the question of automated verification. In this paper, it was focused on automatic verification on semiconductor designs. So on bits uh, and finite structures, uh, Simon is an expert on automated verification of continuous uh, computation with continuous data and in particularly of real numbers. So again, here logic and specifically proof theory uh, plays a crucial role in uh, automatic verification of computer programs. So this is a, a basically a recap of this 2001 work. And uh, what I want to do today is uh, <clears throat> uh, elaborate on uh, some uh, three other aspects, uh, maybe even more uh, accessible to ordinary people uh, uh, beyond mathematicians, beyond computer scientists, where logic <clears throat> has played a crucial role in developing computers and where logic will play a role in future um, computing. So let me three aspects. And here you see this kind of a, a dictionary. On the one side, left is logic. On the right side is computer. So one is a Boolean logic that had led to digital circuits. That's the past. Then contemporary is a 
structures in the sense of model theory that corresponds to abstract data types in object-oriented programming languages. And finally, the axiomatic method as a general paradigm of logic uh, corresponds to information hiding in computer science. So more close connections and arguably even more basic ones than the ones uh, uh, expanded on in the previous paper. Um, um, yeah, and understandable to mathematicians and to computer scientists, at least maybe uh, even to uh, the average person on the street, uh, the people who get to decide, um, um, uh, for example, funding for uh, universities and departments uh, and uh, helpful also to emphasize the importance of logic, for example, to yeah, to, to uh, other departments, right? When they struggle about funding within a university, being able to tell um, why logic is important to non-mathematicians and non-computer scientists can be very helpful. So first point is about uh, the correspondence between Boolean logic and digital circuits. And again, I'm, you all know this, right? So I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but this talk uh, is really actually targeted as uh, other audience. So uh, that's why I'm recording it uh, honestly. So let me uh, remind uh, of uh, the works by George Boole in the 19th century, right? So that's uh, what like 150 years ago, an investigation of the laws of thought Right, so he was formalizing uh, laws of thinking and laws of arguing, for example, uh, in court. And he put that into an, what we nowadays would call an algebraic framework, right? The term algebraic was so, uh, not really coined at that time. So mathematics and in particular algebra. And that, uh, yeah, like 100 years later, let and turned out to be extremely useful in the design of digital circuits because these also process what we would nowadays call Boolean information, namely bits, truth values, zero and one. So um, yeah, that Boole's work on logic, on logic underlies modern digital circuits, that's a pass. Then uh, the second um, um, example is about the correspondence between structures and abstract data types. Now, logicians know all about structures and arguably also mathematicians implicitly and intuitively know what a structure is when they talk about, uh, for example, groups, uh, group theory, that's a, that's a, a class of structures, right? Um, here's some example of a structure Z2 or the field with two elements, that's a mathematical structure. And that obviously corresponds to the computer abstract data type bit. And why is it an abstract data type? Because uh, when we talk about bits in computer science, we don't care about how the bit is implemented. This could be, for example, in, uh, uh, in CMOS where uh, zero, bit zero and bit one correspond to zero volt, zero up to one volt, and bit uh, one corresponds to two up to three volts. But it could be also other technology, other uh, um, silicon technology or gallium arsenide technology. It could be an optical computer. It uh, could be any type uh, how a bit is implemented and abstract data type uh, ignores how it's implemented as long as it satisfies the condition of a, of a bit and that's uh, what it corresponds to a structure. Moving on to another example structure than the structure of natural numbers as examized by the piano axioms. Now in computers uh, when you talk to engineers, uh, electrical engineers, the uh, common way is to uh, uh, correspond that to, to byte, that means eight bits. But of course, byte have this uh, infamous wraparound effect that after 255 plus one equals zero. So that's not the corresponding abstract data type, 
neither is long integer, which also has wraparound effects only uh, later for larger values. Uh, and that's why modern uh, uh, programming languages offer an abstract data type that is called, for example, big integer um, in Java or in Python. And if your favorite programming language does not offer such an abstract data type, then you can include a library like GMP, which provides this uh, abstract data type. And the point here is, uh, or the two points to be made here is first, the big integer uh, or GMP integer corresponds to the mathematical data type of natural numbers. There's no wraparound. It's a perfect coincidence. And secondly, how this data type is implemented, it's not a hardware data type anymore. It's a software data type and how this is implemented in software does not matter. That's the point of having an abstract data type to be independent of the implementation. For example, uh, integer multiplication could be implemented using uh, long multiplication from high school, or it could be implemented using Karatsuba or uh, TUM algorithm or Cook algorithm or Fast Fourier or whatever, uh, but it doesn't uh, matter as long as it behaves exactly the same way as mathematical integers does. Abstract data type correspond to structure. Now, moving on to my personal favorite, that's uh, the structure of real numbers, um, which uh, again is not, course, not correspond to the hardware data type of float or of uh, double, but it corresponds to the data type real provided by uh, one of my favorite um, uh, computer libraries, namely the IRAM library, because again, this data type real uh, in, corresponds exactly to the mathematical structure of real numbers, whereas floating point numbers and double precision numbers all have these rounding errors and do not correspond to that. And the real data type, how it's implemented um, behind the scenes is uh, does not matter, should not matter. There are other libraries that also provide such a data type, uh, for example, um, um, the real lib, uh, by Panimir Lambov also provides that using an entirely different implementation, uh, but it's an abstract data type, so the implementation does not and must not matter. And we uh, could continue and extend that uh, list uh, to other structures like uh, higher order structures, uh, classes of uh, continuous functions, classes of measurable functions, uh, um, um, uh, Sobolev function, uh, in the mathematical side and corresponding abstract data types. Like for example, uh, Simon has uh, implemented uh, together um, with a, a student, uh, the structure of the Grassmannian uh, uh, family of subspaces of a vector space and has turned that into an abstract data type building on the real data type. So. The lesson here is, uh, yeah, so logic and in particularly the concept of a structure from model theory corresponds uh, 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 closely to abstract data types, software implemented data types beyond hardware in the computer realm. So another uh, way of how logic, I'm not sure whether this, is, this has been explicit or, or whether uh, this is a coincidence, but the, the correspondence is really extremely strong and uh, maybe eerie uh, or unusual as uh, the 2001 uh, paper authors uh, called it. So now moving on to the third uh, correspondence, which builds on that is the axiomatic method um, in mathematics, in, in logic, right? Uh, uh, corresponds to information hiding as a, a recent paradigm in computer programming, right? So if you call, recall back, so the first programming languages uh, did not allow for abstract data types, did not allow for information hiding. Any variable was globally visible, for example, in BASIC. Um, that's how I started programming. If you declare a variable, then it is visible everywhere. 
Um, and only later, for example, with the introduction of Pascal programming language, the concept of information hiding turned out to be beneficial, right? Not knowing <laughs> um, ignorance is bliss, if you like. And the same is uh, uh, illustrated by these three um, um, uh, abstract data types that I mentioned in the previous slide. As I said, how a bit is implemented um, does not matter, must not matter. Um, similarly, uh, what the, so, or for moving on, for example, integers, right? What is the definition of integers? And this is a construction, for example, um, by um, uh, John Neumann, right? John Neumann constructed integers built on building on set theory, right? Um, then there's an app uh, way of, uh, um, uh, yeah, anyway, there's the various ways of uh, how to construct integers um, as there are various ways of implementing integers in computer science, right? I mentioned the different, for example, multiplication algorithms and how these uh, algorithms work. Uh, should not matter, must not matter. Similarly, mathematics arguing about integers, number theory, uh, should not, must not, cannot matter uh, how the integers have been introduced in one textbook or another one. And that uh, uh, is even more true for the real numbers. For example, real numbers, um, most engineers and physicists don't even know how the real numbers are constructed. They only operate uh, calculate uh, on real numbers, uh, um, um, but uh, there are several ways of constructing the real numbers on top of the natural numbers, right? For example, you could consider equivalence classes of Cauchy sequences of uh, fractions, that is of uh, fractions of natural numbers, or you could consider great Dedekind cuts. So various ways of constructing the real numbers mathematically. Um, but in the end, what really matters is the properties, that is the axiom satisfied by the thus constructed um, set of real numbers. And similarly, how uh, the data type of real numbers is implemented in IRAM or in real lib uh, does not matter, should not matter, must not matter to the user programmer who is uh, doing calculations with this uh, uh, abstract data type of real numbers. So that's my first, uh, uh, my third point, the course uh, illustrating the correspondence between logic and computer science. And this one are actually also already looking in the future. So we've moved from the past, uh, bool and bit, to the present, natural numbers and integers, to the future, real numbers and, uh, and uh, real data type, and beyond that. and uh, to uh, conclude um, the future. Um, so these are the three examples I've uh, uh, collected here. Um, and I'd like to emphasize that all these examples basically as our computers built on discrete data, right? Those they're built on bits, which are discrete and bits can be combined in a finite way. And uh, Boolean logic is also finite uh, binary logic. But uh, the future, um, well, my pet, <laughs> my uh, research area is uh, to develop computer science of continuous data beyond the discrete, beyond the discretized realm. And uh, if you look at this um, table, the three examples, the second one about structures already pertains, uh, extends beyond the discrete realm, right? So we talked about structure of real numbers, structure of Grassmannian structure of uh, uh, fields, uh, uh, um, yes, um, spaces of continuous functions, spaces of integrable functions, Sobolev spaces. And similarly, abstract data types in principle uh, could also be devised, uh, have been devised for real numbers for Grassmannians. And we should continue doing that also for the uh, higher function spaces, similarly for the axiomatic method, also applies to continuous data as well as to discrete, but um, the lower level, that's where we need to kind of um, uh, step up. 
and device, uh, and I would like to encourage you to devise um, correspondence for that. And arguably on the logical side, good logic is a, a example of non-discrete logic. There are various uh, types of good logic. And uh, on the computer side, that could be analog circuits. So that's what I can imagine correspondence beyond the discrete realm. And that's uh, all I wanted to say. Yes, it seems time is running out. Um, so let me uh, conclude and thank you very much for the opportunity to advertise logic uh, beyond uh, logicians, advertise logic to mathematicians, advertise logic to computer scientists. Thank you very much. And I'm here for your questions and discussions. Okay, uh, any question? Uh, I, I have one question. Uh, uh, in, the, in the last page, uh, uh, to, to realize continuous, uh, continuity, I, I think uh, continue, the concept of continuity is related to the concept of infinity something. Uh, but um, my question is, it, it is possible to uh, realize a, a concept of infinity in computer science? Uh, how to realize infinity in computer science? Yes, I, that, uh, yeah. That's an excellent question. And I get that question all the time because people often believe it's not possible to do that but the implementations of the IRAM library and the implementation of the real lib library demonstrate that it is possible and Seven uh, knows a lot about how to do that. Uh, this is kind of breaking <coughs> the, 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 the force uh, barrier. This is uh, um, beyond the purpose of abstract data type, but uh, let me just uh, say that, uh, you know, like integers, mathematical integers, uh, when they are implemented on a computer, they use a variable number of bytes, right? Um, in order to avoid the wraparound effects and how many bytes uh, the implementation uses gets adjusted dynamically, right? So long integers may be four bytes or eight bytes, but the long int, uh, uh, the, the, the big int data structure uses a variable number of bytes uh, dynamically and determined in the runtime. And similarly, uh, the real number data type uh, as implemented in IRAM or in uh, real lib uh, basically uses a variable number of uh, uh, double precision floating point numbers, but hides from the user how many it uses so that from the user perspective, it uh, seems like it's uh, uh, indistinguishable from exact computation, but in practice, it's always finite number, but a variable number. Does mm -hmm. that answer your very good question? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, maybe. And, and maybe this is the similar question, but uh, uh, when we construct the integer, then we use equivalent relation on uh, natural numbers. And, uh, but you say the, the one way of constructing real number is using Cauchy sequence. And Cauchy sequence to, to, to describe Cauchy sequence, we need, uh, maybe this, is, this question is very similar, uh, but we, when we want to describe Cauchy sequence, then we need infinitely many place of a tuple. So, or uh, uh, I wonder how, how to solve this pro problem to uh, demonstrate uh, right. infinite uh, real, real number. Yeah. Yes, again, excellent question. And this is, uh, turns out to be closely related actually to constructive mathematicians, again, a subfield of logic. In constructive mathematicians, uh, mathematics, uh, there's no equality, right? 
there's uh, yes. only inequality. And similarly, when writing programs in IRAM, uh, you must not test for equality, you can only test for inequality. And that's, of course, something that every numerical scientist has, uh, has known implicitly all the time, right? Don't test for equality. But now we can argue and put that on the formal foundation beyond the, the intuition uh, that uh, uh, numerical mathematicians have used all the time. Okay. Very good question. Okay. Thank you. And again, okay. uh, did I did I mention that Simon is an expert in all these things? Yeah, if okay. not, let, let me let me emphasize that. No. Yes, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I I also have one question. May I may I ask some question? Because uh, it is already over a uh, half hour. So is it okay to uh, ask a maybe, question? Maybe. Maybe we have uh, originally we have one hour and thirty minutes. Uh -huh, I see. Uh -huh. So I think you can uh -huh. go ahead. Uh, my, my question is, uh, in the first part of in your talk, you give uh, uh, some, some algorithm is uh, computable in polynomial time, uh, if and only if it is uh, described in first order logic. So, Uh, so my question is, oh yes, yes, the, the, in the last line, the by result of Immerman and Bardi, a problem is in polynomial time and it is graphed in first order logic with the addition with the fixed point operator. So my question is, uh, if we change the, it is describable in gather logic, in what happened in the uh, left side? So my question, if we change uh, some problem is describable in the gather logic, then such problem, uh, which uh, class of complexity class, which complexity class this problem is belongs to? That's a very good question. That's a technical question and uh, that's beyond my expertise, to be honest. Um, I there's, there's a chance that people working on descriptive, descriptive complexity theory know the answer to your question, but I don't. Uh -huh. um, so, and then, uh, is there any development or advanced on the uh, some model theoretic study on the structure of structure described in Gede logic? Yes, so um, there's uh, um, work by Norbert Preining, um, who's an Austrian logician uh, working in Japan these days. And he has uh, written several uh, deep uh, papers on, on the structure of good, characterizing good logics. So it's plural and uh, its properties, depending on what is the range of values of truth values in this uh, generalized logic. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, then thank, thank, thank for the speaker again. My pleasure, my honor, thank you. Uh, thank